Vidushan, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah, you can, you can start now. Okay. Uh, so I would like to warmly welcome everyone here today to the second Let's Talk session. Uh, so Let's Talk is a series of webinars hosted by the ICT Young Professionals Sri Lanka. Uh, so the whole purpose of Let's Talk is to give awareness of various topics to young professionals. So this time we actually have a joint venture with ISACA uh, to give you the topic of Corona is not the only virus. I think that might be a very interesting topic or might be very contradicting to all of you. What is, uh, everyone knows that Corona is a virus and what do you mean Corona is not a virus? Uh, so with the whole new normal becoming working from home and it's a buzzword for all the organizations, all the workplaces have been shifting to an online platform to fulfill all their professional responsibilities. Given this, most of us don't know that uh, all of us are in a sort of danger uh, that is not open to eyes. Uh, so that's what the whole session about today. So we, the whole, we have a panel discussion about cybersecurity awareness and how everyone should be aware in terms of adapting to secure, uh, secure measures in terms of from unwanted attacks or being a victim to uh, a cyber crime. So we have a very esteemed panel of uh, panel to uh, do the panel discussion. So before I introduce everyone, I would like to introduce the moderator and he would give an introduction to everyone else in the panel. Uh, so as a moderator, we have Kavinga Yapa Abhevadana, a lecturer in cybersecurity in the Department of Computer Systems Engineering of Sri Lankan Institute of Information Technology. He has also been a visiting lecturer to the General Sir John Kotelaur Defense University. He specializes in cybersecurity, enterprise task risk management, social engineering in information security and private privacy management in big data. He is also currently the board member of ISACA Sri Lanka chapter and holds the NCCN and CCNSP professional certification. And he played a very important role in introducing IPTV solutions to the hospitality industry of Sri Lanka. Uh, so I would like to hand over this session to Mr. Kavingayapa to introduce our panel of judges and move forward with the discussion of Corona is not the only virus. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Midushan. Um, so um, let me start off uh, by thanking him. That was a bit of a lengthy introduction to myself. Uh, Anyway, um, so we have a very esteemed panel uh, here. Um, I'll start with uh, Mr. Sujit Christie, um, a very well-known figure from the cybersecurity industry. Um, Sujit is the director of uh, Layer 7 Seguro Consult here, yeah, Private Limited. He's both the founder and the president of Information Security Professional Associates, uh, who is a well-known cybersecurity enthusiast. Uh, he has over about uh, 20 years of experience in GRC domain. Uh, for those who are not familiar with GRC, this is information governance, risk management, and compliance. Uh, cybersecurity consulting, um, financial and information systems auditing, and ERP implementation. Um, he specializes in cybersecurity covering areas like risk management, consulting assurance, IT governance, privacy, uh, vendor evaluation, product evaluation, um, and many other things, uh, including awareness sessions. So he's also the first person in the SARC region uh, to receive the IESC Squared President's Award in 2013. So uh, welcome, Sujit. Uh, thanks for joining us today. So let me uh, unmute all our panel members. Um, right. Okay. And uh, we have Kanishka here, Kanishka Apa, who's a very well-known uh, figure in the security domain as um, we were discussing before the beginning, our cybersecurity community in Sri Lanka is a relatively a small community, so we know each other very well. Um, Kanishka is an assistant manager of information security at Mobitel Private Limited, uh, and he's also a visiting lecturer at uh, in Informatics Institute of uh, Technology, IIT, since uh, 2015. He also serves as the secretary of ISC Squared Sri Lanka chapter. Kanishka is a very highly qualified senior information security engineer with over 11 years of experience under his belt. Most of that time at uh, Sri Lanka Computer Emergency Readiness Team, SLCERT. Uh, he's a certified information system security professional, CISSP, and also CISA, um, certified information systems auditor, and also a certified ethical hacker. 
He has a profound knowledge in information security, both technical and management aspects. And he has been involved in uh, many security incidents, handling them, uh, designing secure networks in both government and private sector. And uh, last but not least, we have Mohan, um, who, I, who I actually work with at the board of ISACA. Uh, Mohan Chaturanga, he's a deputy manager of uh, IT governance at MAS Holdings since 2019. He currently serves as the director of ISACA Sri Lanka chapter, and he's also a visiting lecturer at Sikra Campus Private Limited. Uh, Mo Mohan received his uh, bachelor's degree in computer systems networking and telecommunications at SLIIT. Um, so he's uh, one of the ex-graduates of our university, and he's also uh, certified in lead implement for BS 1012-2017 uh, certification, and also certified information uh, system security manager and advanced certificate in ICT law. Mohan has built a, a name for himself after successfully executing major projects in the cybersecurity domain. So welcome all three of you. So we, we are uh, hoping to have a fruitful discussion today. So um, according to the plan, uh, the agenda, the idea is to go uh, with the flow and to tell the participants what kind of precautions that we should take when it comes to working from home and using the internet for um, our professional activities. So we will talk about precautionary measures as well as safety measures. And uh, our plan is to then move on to discuss about um, how do we know when we are under a sort of a security incident and what kind of things that we should look out for. And then we will move on to what are the steps after a cyber attack or if you think if you, you have been compromised, what should you do after that? So that is the plan for today. So a bit of housekeeping rules very quickly. Um, if you have questions, um, you can use the Q&A section uh, rather than the uh, chat option. I would prefer if you can use the question, uh, question and answer section. And uh, during the session, I will be launching one uh, poll for you to get involved with the session. So um, you can answer that particular poll. Um, I will make sure panelists can also answer the um, poll as well. And uh, for the panelists, if you want to add something to someone's remarks, please uh, jump in and you can disturb because we know each other very well. Uh, there is no restriction here, no problem. Right. Okay. So without further ado, I will um, start off with our first part of the session, which is um, security precautions and uh, safety measures that we should be following when it comes to online activities, right? So let me start with Sujit. I mean, we'll start with basics, Sujit, right? So, because we have different uh, type of people joining us from different industries. So um, Sujit, can you tell us for everyone to understand what is at stake, right? So let's start with that. I mean, what is the fuss about online security? People have had their data stored in the past in papers and sometimes it's been stolen in the past. So why do we need to make such a big case for being extra safe on the internet? Can we start with that? I think uh, you, you're starting off with a very interesting tagline. What is at stake? I think what, what we keep hearing in the last 24 hours to 48 hours is Lady Gaga, <laughs> right? We all know her as a, 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 what do you call, a celebrity? But today she is there in the news for cyber incident. Like her information has been, she has not leaked it, but somebody who had access to her information has lost the information, which is which happens to be a law firm which was dealing with contracts for celebrities. So, so in very simple terms, what is that information? If disclosed to an unauthorized person or accessed by an unauthorized party would put you at a disadvantage, would be considered as an information leakage. Sometimes these leakages can be intentional, where somebody who is hell-bent on disclosing this information, like, you know, they hear something, they can't hold it in their head, like, you know, they've got to go and tell somebody, right? Uh, th there's also somebody who does it unknowingly, accidental. So typically when in an organizational environment, we talk about uh, these two scenarios, somebody who does it unknowingly that they spill the information out into undisclosed or un undesired places, or somebody who is determined to take it and give it all. 
So I think today the biggest challenge is we are all talking about uh, people who are within the network, how secure are they, or are they actually leaking information, especially in an organization environment? So, so we are talking about traditional networks, which talked about uh, untrusted environment, trusted environment, two segments. That's how we traditionally define a network. But in today's context, I, I think uh, what COVID has done is moved everybody who was inside in a protected environment into an unprotected environment. Businesses have kept uh, on working, right? They have continued their operation irrespective where the users were. So now the question is, do we ever have something called a trusted zone? If at all we had one, did we have one? I don't think we had one, right? People talk about new normal. Did we have a normal environment even before, <laughs> right? So it's a degree of variation. So the point I'm trying to raise here is, even if we define something called a trusted zone, if a user knowingly or unknowingly become a victim due to a malware attack or a ransomware attack, what does it leave, it leave us with? It leaves us with another assumed trusted zone to be called as an untrusted zone. Untrust. Right? So our challenge right now, coming back to your question, what is that you and I would lose if our information is disclosed to a third party who is not supposed to have access to that information? And what is the price you and I will have to pay if that information is disclosed, or what is the price we would have to pay to do a damage control? Now, I'm sure a couple of years ago, uh, uh, one of the financial institutions, leading financial institutions in Sri Lanka hit the headlines. Right. They said information disclosure. Now, I think one of the things you all were talking about in your introduction is people anyway had access to it, People anyway had access to them in the form of printout. People took them home, took wherever they went. But why suddenly this has become a hot topic? Here today, information is considered the most valuable asset, which is much more worth than the oil. I think the oil markets crashed a couple of weeks ago, but the value of information never depreciated. It only appreciated. Right. So, so with that note, I'll hand this session back to you. Maybe, you know, you will have a lot more question coming around. So we will take yes, that. So yes. Long. So I will come back to that because that, that's an interesting starting point, um, especially talking about that. Did we ever have something called like a normal environment? I mean, that, that would be a fantastic uh, place for me to turn towards uh, Mohan, uh, who's actually um, responsible for making sure that uh, whichever the organization that he works for is actually safe in that sense, right? So um, let me uh, turn towards Mohan first. Uh, Mohan, um, now many people working from home and they use different types of methods to join. Obviously uh, their work, work environment, it can be either their mobile phone or it can even be their uh, laptop, for example. Um, so let's start with what kind of risks are they facing with this? Um, and do we have any like a specific particular protective way that we can join into our organization? If so, what kind of technologies are we talking about? And I'm gonna attach very quickly another question to this. Now that just like Sujit explained, traditional security boundaries have completely blurred. We can't see a boundary uh, with this uh, bring your own device and working from home and all these things. Um, what sort of precautions can organizations take so in return, how can employees make sure that they are actually adhering to these security measures and policies? So what, what is the balance here? Mohan. Yeah. So uh, first of all, thank you all for having me here. So it's great to be here. And uh, to start off with that question carving, I think uh, Sujit gave a very uh, good introduction on uh, why are we at this point? Like how, how are we here? So what's the context of it? But if you look at uh, when you say uh, the network or other how we work or all that, uh, four months back, 
when we were in organizations, we were talking about like uh, in 2019, can we do a pilot of work from home just to try out uh, how it works out? So just to make sure that uh, the things are working or not. And most of the times, I think um, most of the industries, um, even in telco or FMCG or banking, so they were more reluctant to try this out. Now, all of a sudden, the total dynamic has changed. Uh, Sujit has also mentioned that we used to a place called office to connect to the uh, office infrastructure or rather the office network, network to work yeah. with. Now that uh, the thing is the office is still there. Our data centers are still there in data center and our data is there in cloud. All those technologies are there, but the way we connect, the place rather we connect has changed. So I think uh, in terms of understanding the security around uh, connections and how people come in, this is the uh, phenomena that we need to put our head around. So it's not that the data set where it resides has changed. It's not how the business dynamic has changed, but rather how people connect and where they connect from has changed. So now for most of the established organization, once again, this is you know, uh, this is uh, not much of a challenge in a certain way because most of the people are using laptops anyway, right? But uh, trust me, there's a larger portion of uh, maybe in the industry also, we have talked to a lot of our peers who have uh, who are struggling around people who work with PCs or, you know, shared PCs in the manufacturing domain, all this. So for them, it's a different challenge. But further, as you were asking about the corporate and the majority, of the uh, corporate and the majority of the SMEs. The question is around understanding who are we connecting and how are they connecting the employees. So that's the first point of thing that we need to understand. So previously, majority of the office staff connected from a safe place called office, which is in a secured kind of a LAN, which is protected by a firewall, a kind of a location that we know. So the risks and vectors and threats, everything out there is known. So now uh, it is. it has come to a point, all of employees feel like outsiders connected to our network. So now the, the vectors have changed the, what we called as uh, rather the exposure of the total network has changed. But uh, the people who are connecting are some people that we know. So where we can ask them to do certain things. So you were, you were asking about uh, what about things like VPN and uh, all that, right? But what, what I would think is we'd have to think more holistically first, then drill down to the technologies, how we connect. For an example, we are talking about people who are outside a zone now, who are connecting from home, some people connect from even not home, somewhere else. So few things that you understand is the endpoint that they're connecting from, that's one key thing, maybe a company provided laptop or some people go in from a home laptop or something like that, is that has different uh, security measurements that we need to look into, but it's the device. So the simple things around the device itself, we need to understand and include. So the security and all the things that we look into the device itself, the antiviruses and, you know, putting up the software firewall there and, you know, securing their home routers and all. So that's definitely there. Then comes the part that particular device is going to connect to our office network once again. So now uh, in here comes your connectivity uh, question directly. How are we going to make sure that they are secure? Previously, even if in the banking industry or even manufacturing, when a site is connected, so that comes to a trusted network, maybe a site-to-site -site VPN or maybe you know technologies like that. But now each and every individual uh, you know, uh, you know, individually have to make sure that they are connecting securely. So this is where all VPN story comes in. So virtual private network, so, you know, uh, encrypted tunnel from our laptop to the data source that we are connecting. So, so this is the conversation. I mean, everyone is talking about VPNs. So uh, last few years back, everyone was talking about VPN because the internet was down and you can't go to Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now everyone is talking about VPN because you want to connect securely to the office. So, so now the whole story about VPN comes in. So then it's a matter of, you know, once the, that connection is secured, once you verify that particular person, nice, the one that you need to log into, so authentication is there. So then and it's a matter of, once again, the organization security you're talking about, which we have been dealing with already, the network, the infrastructure, databases, systems, applications, everything. So then, then, then a known vector, 
right? We had a known vector. So, but uh, the whole unknown vector or rather the unknown risks are residing in, uh, once again, outside the organization, the end user, how they connect and all that VPNs. And some people maybe uh, later when you talk about, the, you said you have three stages. So in the third stage, maybe we can go there. So how, how, how there's certain administrators who people who look after this infrastructure. So they have privilege accounts, right? So it's not just users. So how would they connect? Is it just VPN? Do you want any remote desktop protocols? So this is the whole dynamic to change. But in terms of security, I think all organizations, what they are trying to understand here is, yes, the business dynamic has changed. But in terms of security, the, what is the architectural change that you're looking at? What has changed? So the users who are connecting where they are and how the visibility, the our eyes on them has changed. So the security is now focused there. So whatever that we had done in that particular office, now it is focused there. And that's how the dynamics have primarily changed. Okay. Right. Um, so that's uh, excellent. Um, once again, um, entry point for our next question, which is uh, to Kanishka, because now, uh, as you said, the dynamics have changed in a way that um, uh, the only major difference is how they are connecting. So now that's where actually where Kanishka actually comes in, because now you are one of the uh, leading service providers in the country. Uh, Mobitel and you know that of course the domestic internet usage has increased due to working from home um, and COVID-19 situation. So um, because of this at the same time cyber criminals who are targeting domestic users are also um, they're happy about this because the, um, they know that the do domestic increase has in, uh, usage has increased. So let's talk about the device itself that the user is connecting. Let's assume that it is not a company provided laptop that is not uh, fully updated with antiviruses or firmwares and operating system. Um, if it is a laptop that I'm, I didn't use for last one and a half years, right? I might have software, hardware, firmware, operating system that I have not updated, but I'm just plugging it into the router and I want to connect to the organization or uh, do something else. Um, what kind of um, vulnerabilities and problems are we facing with outdated things like this? And what sort of cyber attacks must, must an internet user be most vigilant about in this kind of a situation? Kanishka, sorry, I think um, we can't hear you. Let me see. Kanishka, unmute your mic, please. Okay, done. Uh, right. uh, can hear you yeah. Thank you, Kavinga. Uh, for having me and everybody. So, uh, like uh, the traditional threats that have been there all this time, like uh, the threats uh, which are facing by internet users, uh, for example, scams, phishing sites, and uh, uh, various spam mails, spyware, ransomware, and identity theft and malicious software like viruses and trojans, they always been there. So new kind of threats are coming always. The threat landscape is evolving as well as uh, if you take uh, the traditional threats, the now the working from home condition has evolved and uh, uh, the end users are more mostly vulnerable. Like they, at the end points, they, they are more vulnerable like uh, Mohan also mentioned, uh, as well as uh, if you take scams, like it's a confidence trick that the user is played upon and uh, at the uh, other side, uh, for example, there are uh, lottery scams mm -hmm. where uh, people promote lotteries uh, for unsuspecting users that they have won some millions of dollars and uh, try to collect information from the end user, their credit card number details and various other sensitive information from the end user. That is what you uh, encounter in a scam. And as well as you have phishing sites, phishing information, which have also very uh, grown in uh, length uh, where they collect the user details like usernames and passwords uh, for their phishing attacks, these are being targeted uh, more and more in the out outside uh, environments. And uh, these uh, internet users are faced with uh, more threats through that. 
so uh, traditionally there has been spam and spam has been always uh, becoming a problem to office environments as well as uh, they collect uh, sensitive information through users uh, through spam attacks. So um, ransomware has always been a case where um, you have encountered ransomware in various parts of the country, like uh, where these ransomware attacks uh, we have encountered in, uh, uh, for example, photo studios. These uh, owners, they have uh, uh, encountered ransomware and all their photo uh, images that they have uh, uh, stored in their laptops, they have been encrypted due to ransomware. So these ransomware threats mostly comes through video editing software which uh, they are they have downloaded through untrusted sources and uh, torrent sites and other uh, sources so this has becoming become a huge threat uh, the ransomware attacks uh, in the industry so likewise uh, in 2017 may we encountered the WannaCry ransomware so the ransomware threat landscape has also grown in very, very much uh, due to during the past few months and years as well. So uh, that's uh, my point of view uh, for, for the threat landscape and the yes, type of yes. threats that are out there. Right, thank you very much, uh, Kanishka. I think that's a very good point you're saying that uh, all the problems that we had before, it's still there. It's just that uh, uh, we still need to make sure that uh, we have all the basic precautionary um, uh, things in place. Uh, the only difference is now, sometimes your organization might not be there to help you because um, it might be the protection mechanisms are um, not able to protect you because now that you're working from home. Um, so that's interesting. So uh, that uh, turns me towards Sujit because now um, Kanishka was talking about these um, uh, phishing emails and phishing scams and these lottery kind of approaches. And uh, talking about phishing yesterday, I received an email that my Hotmail account is about to expire. And I was, I was uh, and that bypassed my spam inbox as well. And it came to my inbox and it says, I have to click some link to uh, make sure that it does not expire within 24 hours. So if, if a completely unaware citizen um, look at an email like that. They get very easily scammed and they get very easily tricked to, um, because they worry about their email account, obviously, especially working from home. So Sujit, can you tell us what is actually this social engineering? Because um, what, what do they look like and how serious are they? And are there any good techniques that we can use to make sure that we don't fall a victim of a social engineering attack? Absolutely. So, so we are all emotional, right? Otherwise, we won't be human beings. Right? We have a lot of emotions. Uh, the, the packets, when I say the packets, the bits and bytes, yes. they don't have any emotion. Right? So either it is a zero or a one. So it is much more easier for an attacker to play with human emotions than to change a zero to one or one to a zero. So if you look at all the scams which are there, Kanishka gave ample amount of examples, right? And uh, he has firsthand seen some of these incidents uh, uh, in his uh, career. They, they always find a way to convince you. Uh, they, they always say, right? When you tell a lie, ensure that you have a little bit of truth in it. So the whole lie looks like a truth. <laughs> right? We've heard that. So if you look at these mails, sometimes they may say, hey guys, I've got your password. So they may have got hold of a password which you used long time ago. Now, as we talk, you know, there are so many account compromises where the hackers have the username and password. And sometimes, you know, I've come across people where they say, hey, this password, this in, the email I've received says that they got the password and the password is their son or the daughter's name. 
very convincing, isn't it? Because they can relate to it. They know that they have used it and some of them have never changed their passwords. So they will find an element of truth in the big lie. And sometimes they might come and say, hey guys, I got pictures of you. Right? I got pictures of you. But if they have pictures of you or videos of you, which is uh, something which you wouldn't want to put it up in the public domain, why not show it? Again, playing with emotions. Now, sometimes a friend of you might send you an email saying, oh, I'm at Spain, stranded. My wallets have been stolen. I've lost my passport. The electricity in the hotel has been knocked off, but you're still able to send an email. Right? Can you send me some money? I need to get back to my country. I mean, these are examples which I am relating to, which I have heard from the known circles. So the last example I was talking about, somebody asking for money to get back to Sri Lanka, I told this gentleman, when you wake up first thing in the morning, call your friend and ask where he is. Call the landline number. It won't cost you much. And there he did, right? He woke up early in the morning, six o'clock, he calls his friend and the friend was woken up from his sleep. Right? So somebody had gained access to the email. So a lot of time, people use the play, I mean, they, they use the emotions to either scare you. Now, the email you got, it said it will expire. Yeah. Right? And we are worried, right? I mean, today, if we, I mean, whether we have food or not, if you don't have bandwidth, then you have a serious problem. <laughs> right? Yes. That's how life has evolved to, right? So a lot of time, these guys know what our weaknesses are, our human weaknesses, and they target that. And all of us as human beings, we can fall prey to it. So that's point number one. Number two, today, I think we, we all have the habit of clicking on everything which appears on our screen. And sometimes it's not intentional, accidental, right? Sometimes you probably would even somebody calling you and you pick up the phone, no response at the other end, right? Accidentally dial. So, so like there could be a click, there could be a click here, a click there, and somebody has actually gained access to it or like probably planted a backdoor into your device. And the third aspect is there are, there are robots which are available there, which people use to track you or you know, even be, follow your activities on the net. So they harvest your information. I can give you cite one example, right? I mean, I, about last year, I wanted to go to Hyderabad and I was trying to, I could hear in the background, the TV working and the TV was talking about uh, Go Ibibo, right, uh, website. So I thought, okay, let me go there and check the prices. And, and being in the security, I always believe that using different sites on the same browser different tabs, it could read that information. So I used a different browser. Okay. So I was logged into Chrome, I was logged into maybe uh, the uh, Edge. And one of these, when I actually accessed it, it actually asked me, Sujit, do you want me to create an account using your Gmail account? Mm. Completely different, but it is able to read our information. So that's the biggest challenge, right? So, so so for us to keep up with the pace is going to be challenging. But I guess when you talk from, when I talk from an average citizen perspective, that's a huge challenge for us. All of us who are on this panel, we don't have the bandwidth to go and educate everybody. And the people out there are not the people who actually joined us on this webinar. Mm -hmm. And today we need to start talking about protecting those people who are not on these webinars or the people who do not attend webinars or conferences. Right, I'm sure Mohan and uh, Kanishka will agree because that's the biggest challenge, right? We are talking about 22 million population in this country, which needs to be protected at all levels, right? So I'll leave that thought with you, how we would protect right. it's a different challenge. I'll hand the session back to you. Thank you very much, Sujit. So that's a very valid point because um, the people who actually want to join this kind of a discussion is actually a person who's um, at least slightly aware of what is security and what is happening around the security domain. Um, 
but um to put into context i would say my father is one of the persons who should be educated most about these kind of things he's always um talking about these lotteries as kanishka said you know all these things the emails so text messages he's getting so um that i can do personally so i think everyone has a bit of a um uh, responsibility to take whatever the message that we discuss here and take it beyond this point and uh, make sure that we educate whoever we knows um, just so we, yes yes sujit this is thought right i mean i i i've seen i've taken pictures of people buying lotteries on the streets if you go and talk to them they probably buy maybe 1000 rupees worth of lotteries and they probably win about 10 rupees now here you get a mail for a lottery which you have never bought <laughs> <laughs> that is true yes right oh, over to you kan yes yes Kana. including uh, winning things like iphones and you know all these uh, uh, very valuable items um so with that um, i want to come back to mohan about this um, because now we uh, kanishka introduced this word ransomware a um, lot of people are still getting to getting used to this word so by the way for the participants i have just launched a poll where you can interact with us uh, regarding different types of attacks that you have experienced or someone you know or someone uh, close to you have experienced so that will be interesting towards the end of the session i will release the results and we can see how uh, people are familiar with these terms and um, so mohan ransomware is a serious threat you know i mean when we talk about uh, wanna cry uh, situation and then later on uh, uh, different types of ransomware coming in um, so if it is a domestic user it's a personal user who's using his com- uh, computer whether it is for a uh, business like you know photography as kanishka said uh, uh, a person whose uh, most important data is in the laptop how do they identify when something like this has happened how do they know that um, oh my god it's here what do i do about it now and can there be anything that can be done to reverse it or limit the damage at least oh, over to you mohan yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, in terms of ransomware so one thing uh, when you look at it uh, from a end user perspective at a personal usage point of view so i would say at this region you will be at a lesser risk because ransomware kind of malware falls into the higher grade of uh, attacks which requires actually the attacker to uh, spend a lot of time uh, into uh, you know preparing one combining a lot of uh, intel combining a lot of uh, knowledge around the programming lot of modules into it uh, into the malware itself so that's kind of a ransomware that we're looking at but the problem is as sujit mentioned also uh, so our entire network is as strong as our weakest link so in that sense what will happen is if one of us gets in so ransomware is something that would uh, like to work its way through to a corporate network yeah it will look for a crown jewel actually so so i give a bit of a background about ransomware is the ransomware that we used to know is a, a, a malware which comes in and encrypts all our valuable files right so that's the ransomware that we know so general disc- description of it so throughout years now ransomware is changing its uh, behavior and threat actors are, are now launching different models so actually if you go through darknet you will understand that ras ransomware as a service is a model that is out there so how, how you do is it's kind of a 70 30 payout model where you work with threat actors and uh, then you compile these uh, uh, codes into you know several people getting together in a forum so one gives you uh, an attack vector right let's say the uh, stolen credentials are there for sale in dark web right so you acquire them so that's one and then you go to get one executable file which you you know uh, maybe stop all the resources or stop all the services on a server or an end device so likewise a lot of people get together and create this ransomware now. so the basic of the ransomware itself is available so you people purchase it and they uh, launch an attack so how they launch an attack actually is trying to identifying a, a weak link to get in so uh, there was a report actually released uh, like uh, last for the further actually for 2020 q1 so one of the major attack vectors uh, was email phishing right 
So ransomware gets into the network through email phishing. So number two is remote desktop protocols. So if you have heard, so remote desktop capabilities, even Microsoft Windows has it. So you connect through your computer to the production or the, or the office environment. So that is one vector. So then we have the software and vulnerabilities, software vulnerabilities and all that to get into. So how these people get in is, okay, now some credential is out there in cell in maybe in dark web or somewhere, they get that and maybe use the normal attacking mechanisms to get in. So now the traditional ransomware that we used to know, they will go and, you know, uh, look for the files. So now if you, uh, there are a few popular ones these days, uh, one we called uh, uh, Nifty Family. Nephilim mm. and uh, Maze is one, uh, Defi is one. So there are like few popular mm. things these days. So what these guys would do is then they look for credentials within the network. What we mean by usernames, password, privilege accounts, when you get to a corporate network. So it may be banking, it may be manufacturing, it may be retail. So whatever the network, they look for privilege accounts. So try to see whether, okay, what is there? And then they get uh, hold of one of it. And then you you know go ahead and uh, encrypt all these critical files that they see. And say, leave a note saying, okay, hey guys, here I have encrypted all your files. I have the key. Why don't you pay me? So now apparently in the last quarter, these payments have now reached somewhere around. Uh, so the Q1 report from uh, one of the security researchers saying that in US, it has now reached to 2.5 to 4.5 million dollars for the decryption keys. So now the next part now recently what has happened is now these people, before they encrypt, they're trying to get some data and you know run away and then only encrypt, right? So now these, the total attack which is happening on the network you know, might have come from that weakest link out there because of the situation that we have started from working working from home, um, yeah. right? So that weakest link has, you know, that user now need, a, uh, you know, some kind of a connectivity to the corporate environment and that has come through that, but it has navigated our network. But once again, even ransomware drills down to the, the primary controls that we have. So if they can't steal credentials, yes, uh, so it, it, it will be difficult for them to, you know, go through the network, which we in technical terms call lateral movement. So it will be hard for them to go through the network, right? So so what will happen is then may probably they might give up or they might get caught maybe through your endpoint, maybe through security operation center, this lateral movement and correlations will be captured. But the idea behind now is now the whole dynamic has changed. So with this, the threat vector that I uh, explained on the last question as well, the new set of uh, attack surface, which we call, yeah. has changed. And are they opening doors for ransomware people to get in? Because they just need a door to get in. Bro. So then after that, what we'll do is look for crown jewels and go for it and, you know, have the business disruption and try to, you know, exfiltrate data or something like that. So the education actually need to happen ransom, in ransomware is, yes, of course, the technical controls are there, but uh, the technical controls to focus, you know, understand the behavior of the ransomware and enforce them through the organizations. So the professionals who are actually in this forum and, you know, who are getting into the professional areas of cybersecurity would need to focus on understanding behavior of this rather than the, you know, uh, the previous understanding of you know every uh, attack is the malware now we need to understand specifically behavior about ransomware and on and in regarding the current work situations so i think that more for of us for us to understand any attack vector anything even in ransomware and all other malwares so they are looking for a path to get in so it, it for us to understand is that okay they have to secure the new setup of the users or other people who are connecting the new setup we need to make sure that they are secure. So, so the channels are secure as well as, as uh, Sujit also mentioned, the phishing, email phishing. Then we have, there's something called wishing where you phone, call someone and, you know, try to get their personal information. Hey, your password is expired. Let me reset that to you. So we, even recently I had a wonderful experience with one of the banks. They were calling me from a random, num random number and asking me, why do you're not using your mobile application for banking. So why don't I reset that for you? 
So he was <laughs> asking me to give a different mobile number to send the OTP in. Yes. So actually, then I I, I luckily knew the uh, security person who's heading the security there. I called him and say, hey, the, I got this call. This is the number. Then actually, it turns out to be a legit call. But the only thing is because of the behavior of the application, they can't disable this feature these times. But let's say if this would have been a spam, but a normal user would never have identified it. So then that's the channel that even ransomware, the attack vector is, the payload is going to come in. So even ransomware, you need to understand the behavior. If for me to summarize that answer, you need to understand the behavior. But once again, we are looking at the fundamentals of uh, strengthening the baseline security controls of all these platforms. Right. Uh, so that was a very uh, good explanation about ransomware and where that it inf infiltrates your um, uh, network or the PC itself. Um, so I'm turning towards Kanishka now. Kanishka, let's uh, uh, combine, merge all these different threat vectors that you discussed uh, in the beginning, including um, malware, ransomware, phishing uh, attacks and everything. So once it is in your device, one, once it is within your perimeter, uh, for a simple domestic user, what are the clues that that is that are there that they can see something is wrong? What are the basic clues that they can look for that something is wrong with my PC? This is not the usual. So what should they look for? Okay. Um... Yes. Um... There are ways and means uh, you can identify certain something has gone wrong in your PC. You have the usual symptoms. The PC slows down. Uh, there's uh, usually outbound network traffic that you can monitor, which are, which are going unusual outbound network traffic. So these are called indicators of compromise, like different types of uh, activities that uh, show you that uh, something is uh, some malware has in infected your pc so these could uh, have anomalies in privileged user account activity and mm. suspicious registry or system file changes in your computer uh, that uh, as well as unusual DNS requests, unexpected patching of systems, uh, signs of DDoS activity. These are some of the ways that you can identify that uh, something has, uh, something is not right not in your right, yeah. environment. So um, thank you very much. So the, basically, if you were used to using your laptop and the laptop has a normal behavior, like what we call a baseline behavior, and suddenly uh, it shows that network traffic is too much and you know maybe um, slowing down unnecessarily and abrupt applications starting up, as you said. So uh, those are the telltale signs that you should be looking for when it comes to maybe um, uh, let's say your PC is being compromised or not. So that that is a very important point. Thank you very much, Kanishka. So um, I just yes. want to yes, add yes, a few yes. points here. Yeah. I mean, uh, I just make it uh, very brief. Yeah, yeah sure. In of time, uh, COVID nineteen, right? On this subject, there were more than twenty two thousand domain names registered in the last two months, hmm. of which two thousand plus websites were confirmed to be malicious. Hmm. Now just imagine every living being was in need of information to know what this is all about. So anything with COVID-19 was a bait. Right? And uh, nobody told which is right, which is not right. I mean, maybe, you know, if those of us are in the industry, probably we used, a, used sophisticated tools, so we could probably identify by certain indication that, you know, you were accessing a malicious site. But for a common man, that would have been a big challenge, right? So it would have been a very subtle uh, attack into the mm -hmm. device and may not even manifest, right? So today, the sophistication is so high, they would just persist. They may not even show up. They're just potentially waiting for hoping that, you know, this particular device would enter a corporate network. 
right? So, right. so they would also look for telltale signs. The second one, which I also thought is very important that we talk about it today, and a lot of, lot of us, right? most of us, right? Uh, the moment there is an internet lockdown or the moment you know that you want to get certain information which is restricted in a certain geography, the first thing people resort to is a VPN, a free VPN. I'm asking the panelists, when was the last time you guys bought me lunch? Free. <laughs> right? There is nothing called a free lunch, right? Maybe once. Yeah. But when somebody is giving it free, that means they expect something in return. return yeah. Right, and it's a peering network. So if they, if you can access the other side and get information, the other side also can retrieve information from your device. And sometimes they can even plant malware into your device. And the research shows that most of these free VPNs were terminating in malicious serv servers. So which, mean, which means knowingly or unknowingly, most smartphones without a proper protection. When I say a proper protection, no antivirus, no uh, you know other protection, whatever we may use in a standard device, that is vulnerable. And the attackers know it, right? I mean, today most of the people use smartphones, and it's an easy vector for them to reside on. Now that's the biggest challenge we as a community is faced. Right, so so we cannot. I mean, today people don't use a traditional desktop or a laptop to do work. Convenience. You have a smartphone, you access it. All you need is a URL, username, and a password. How many of you? How many of us have even enabled multi-factor authentication to minimize such attacks? Let's not even look at the corporate applications. How many of us in this forum have enabled multi-factor authentication for LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, Twitter, and so on and so on? Simple stuff. Of our in email. So I guess the, the, the challenges are many, right? I mean, today we look at convenience, ease of use, and then comes security. So security is always a moving target. Now, when we started, we, we, uh, I think Mohan, you mentioned about, right? I mean, whatever attack vectors or the methods they have used, it's always been there. And everybody, right from the beginning, I have a slide which I've been using in all my presentations the last 20 years. Password capturing was the biggest challenge. It was a challenge. Today, it is never a challenge. You, you automate it. Yeah. So they, kept, they look for the same information, but using different mechanisms. mechanisms. Over to you, Kavi. Right. Thank you very much, Sujit. So that, that's a very important addition to our last uh, discussion. So um, now I think uh, we have come towards the end of the discussion today. Uh, so we've talked about the precautionary aspect of it, as well as how do organizations um, should actually um, look at different ways that the, the employees are connecting to their infrastructure, all those things. And uh, now let's talk about what happens after something goes wrong. Right, so I'm going to once again, um, uh, actually, maybe this is this might be a question where Sujit and Kanishka can both uh, give their opinion because uh, Kanishka has a bit of experience with dealing with uh, SL cert and uh, they, they have been handling these kind of situations. Sujit, uh, if you are a victim of a cyber attack, um, irrespective of the uh, type of the attack and the magnitude of the attack, do we have particular authorities that should be contacted? So what can we do about it? And what is the process that we should follow? And if Kanishka can come in later on with what are the legal aspect of it? What up to what extent can you help the victim? And after that, what is the only um, help that you can give as an authority? So we'll start with Sujit and then we can move to yeah. Kanishka. So, so I have two questions for your question, right? First and foremost, me as an individual, at what point in time will I know that I am, I am a victim of a cyber attack? There are certain attacks I will not even know about it. Now, there are certain things which are very easy to manifest. Now, for example, let's say somebody stealing my username and password and then take over my account, May say Facebook. Or sometimes it might be a, a attack on my character, where somebody is running a fake account and accusing me of uh, certain things or propagating malicious uh, content about a person or even 
talking about uh, you know mispropagated or misinformation so so when you look at the type of cybersecurity incident right let's say if let's say your machine has got compromised ransomware then the question is did you take adequate precaution and yet it got compromised right i mean we have individual users and corporate users right so corporate users would actually handle it differently but the individuals probably will have in differently so the point i'm trying to raise here is first understand you know there is an issue there is a challenge and who do we go to if it is in an organization does the organization have a structured framework to say what are the prerequisites to secure an individual device or individual user and what information needs to be protected if those are not defined then you have a challenge now typically i mean we talk about the nist framework the five five things i always keep talking about in all the forums right we need to know what we are going to protect so we need to identify it. then we need to protect it and we need to also have a mechanism to see if there are any alerts which are coming out of it to detect if you can't detect let's say if there is an alert let's say if there is an infection your antivirus says okay there is an infection i can't remove this infection if nobody attends to it what good is it so typically you're talking about the next two steps response and resolution mm -hmm. this typically has to be hardened practice practice refined all the time and every single alert has to be responded to now in an individual's case some some may be knowledgeable users like you and me but the majority of them may not even know that there is an issue right so if they don't know it will never come to light unless somebody tells you hey guys you know i am seeing this information about you in this forum or i see this information being propagated in a different forum yeah. so the first stop for individuals including the corporates would be to reach out to the sri lanka cert yeah. right so so i would hand that over to kanishka to run then through the process right so he's the best person who can actually talk about that process from the time you know an incident is detected how could a a, a regulated organization or a government entity could help us to address an issue kanishko thank you uh, sujit uh, yes uh, of course uh, the national center for cyber security in sri lanka is sri lanka cert and all the general public uh, and private and uh, public individual users everybody can relate their cyber security incidents uh, to uh, this uh, center for cyber security in sri lanka sri lanka cert uh, organization so they, these uh, security issues may range from social media incidents social media incidents as well as uh, Uh, real security incidents like vi virus and malware infections and related uh, cyber crime fraud and uh, those activities money transfer money transfer as well yeah yes yeah. in addition to sri lanka cert uh, you can report these incident to the cyber crime department in the cid as well so that's uh, another avenue that users can get help from Uh, re related to cyber security incidents now sri lanka cert has handled uh, so many social media related uh, incidents uh, related to users as well as they have uh, uh, connections with the facebook organization so they are able to help you in uh, social media related incidents right so uh, that's that's very important i think that last point where that um, when you know that there is an authority that is that is the kavinga yes uh, yes mohan go ahead please on the point that sujit also mentioned that when will you know that you are you are compromised or are your data is breached so i think in the in the post i um, mean the live telecast there's a question around there's a message going i know this password is there i know your password this is your password i require your complete attention in upcoming yeah. 24 hours i'll make sure that they this embarrassment the rest of your life so this is actually we are, even i have been contacted like by 20 25 individuals that they have received <laughs> this message 
so this uh, so this data is out there so this is usually like these days uh, during march there was a lot of noise around uh, in, in dark web there is a huge data dump of usernames and passwords so now someone is just you know running a script taking that up running a script password is there the message is the same email is there and i'm sending it off so now only you know that your password is changed i mean compromised so when you have the same password for all your web logins right it's just having the same key to your door and the house and the office and the car yeah. right so now all people are understanding that these days they understand that okay my data is compromised what should i do so this is the general education i think even the other uh, panelists were talking about that everyone should understand i think i want to point this out because this is telecasted in i mean uh, yes. facebook so people i think yeah yeah i think what what you guys are trying to say is when it comes to cyber security prevention is always better than cure absolutely yes so, that is the idea to add to what uh, mohan is trying to say is don't use a single password for all your applications yeah that's the golden rule golden rule yeah right use different right. passwords make Excellent. it complex and Excellent. it's like how you change your toothbrush change the passwords also frequently <laughs> right? right if you can't remember passwords then try and reduce the number of applications you use yes and of course you have those online wallets and all those things mm -hmm. okay it gives you a certain amount of protection but then you need to be careful about where you keep that one single key as well absolutely absolutely Both so you uh, and uh, Thank you very much, guys. I think um, we've uh, run out of time as well. Um, we've just hit our uh, one hour mark. And um, uh, Q and A section, um, Sujit, by the way, behind the scenes, he was answering some of the questions for me. So that's uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. So, um, so I I don't think um, we need. Uh, maybe I will just take one of these questions. Especially, uh, I'm gonna uh, push it towards Mohan. Um, one question that is given by one of the attendees is uh, that. the organizations are relatively the um, organizations not in general maybe in where he works they are reluctant to make investments towards security with covid coming in uh, uh, financial targets being the biggest uh, uh, driver behind all these things um, so what is your opinion on this and how do we make sure that the reasonable amount is invested on security um, despite the financial restrictions that we are facing due to covid yeah so uh, i mean all the industries are affected by the situation and the predictions of the all the economic conditions are not looking good for some of the sectors are highly uh, impacted and some like uh, manufacturing apparel and the sectors that i'm from also and uh, other sectors like banking and retail all will also be affected so this is definitely a financial concern but uh, the how how you assess this is what is the impact that you are going to have by not having a controls so this always derive from not so this is the conversation that's going to drive back from anti virus to network access control to endpoint security to dlp to the crown jewels if you are a bank what about your customers data if you are a healthcare organization how about all person identifiable data and health data being out there in the public so if you are in the manufacturing sector how about your all trade secrets and you know customer data out there in the public so then you weigh in these two options so what is the impact that all this data being out there and the operational impact that is going to have let's say you just had you know uh, 15 curfew passes done for 15 people to come in and now around all of a sudden there's a ransomware attack and your network is down these people are not working mm -hmm. they have taken a risk to come to the office and your services are down so are you going to take that kind of a risk or what is the investment that is there to mitigate that so sometimes now these days in these times sometimes avoiding so in risk terms we talk we we take about uh, mitigation as well as avoidance so in mitigation you have to implement the control invest and implement the control but sometimes with the recent developments with covid also coming into play sometimes we avoid that right you know we 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 don't do that function because it's too risky to do it right now and it doesn't generate immediate cash for us so maybe we leave it aside Yeah. So these are some of the decisions that will drive, but definitely the business case of the crown jewels being out there and the cooperation being down against the investment of the control. So that's the way in that the management need to go. So that makes your life, uh, your job, the most difficult in the world <laughs> <laughs> to convince people spend money on uh, security. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, right. I think um, I, we had one more question coming in. I think uh, all questions were answered uh, live by Sujit. So I must thank him for uh, responding to that since we have run out of time as well. I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, IEEE Young Professionals Sri Lanka for arranging this session. And um, along with that, uh, for ISACA Sri Lanka chapter for partnering with IEEE uh, young professionals and uh, to do this as a joint venture. And um, if you have any feedback regarding the session, please feel free to um, share with us in the Q&A section uh, or else you can use the chat thread, obviously, no problem. And um, I would like to thank our panel members despite their busy schedules. I know they don't have any, um, you know, eight, eight to five working schedules these days. Um, they're on call all the time. They're busy, uh, but they somehow manage some time along, uh, along that way, uh, their schedules uh, to participate today. And I uh, would really like to thank all of um, uh, you for joining this. And uh, we, might, we might actually want to bring you back here for a, maybe an advanced discussion on a particular topic that is actually, hopefully, once again, if we can get feedback from participants on a particular area that they would like us to discuss, um, we will make sure that we get these experts uh, um, into the panel again. Uh, thank you very much, guys. So, um, Mitushan, um, if you are there, I'm going to hand the control over to you. Um, and I think... Uh... Kavinga, just one thought. Yes, Sujit. Uh, if, let's say, people have any questions or if they have any questions after the session is over, ask them to drop a mail to you. So we as a panel, we, we would definitely respond to each and every question. Or if they need to have a chat in terms of having more details, because there were some questions, I can't give a one-line answer. It requires a lengthy discussion. So we'd yeah. be more than happy to share our experience and knowledge with everyone who is on this uh, webinar. Yeah, excellent. Um, so um, uh, Midushan, you can take over. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me as well as the moderator. Uh, so thank you everyone for actually giving a very insightful uh, background into the whole thing. I guess the biggest highlight is prevention is better than cure. I guess everyone should be aware about how they can mitigate most of the risk that they might be fallen into. So uh, once again, uh, thank you Kavinga for moderating this session. Uh, and uh, thank you to all the panelists, Mr. Sujit, uh, Mr. Mohan, and Mr. Kanishka for sharing all your insights. Uh, once again, I would like to also uh, thank the ISACA chapter for partnering up with IEEE Young Professionals for giving us the opportunity to have all of you all and get expert views on this. Uh, so, so to all the attendees through uh, Zoom as well as uh, uh, through Facebook, uh, there is a very significant amount of participants in terms of both platforms. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today uh, and making this uh, making some get to get uh, and making this event uh, success and also hope you guys got something out of it. I'm pretty sure I got a lot as well. Uh, uh, also thank you everyone for joining once again and hopefully everyone will also join us in the other sessions as well. Uh, so once again, thanks to all the panelists and to the moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, so hope you guys all join us in the next session. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.